Good to have them here today. We bless them. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Kathy and I are so honored to be able to lead this church. I believe these are the best days we've ever had. <laughs> you say, how can you say that really? No, I can say that really because you know what? We, we went 10 weeks and never met face to face. And our church continued to be strong and continue to touch people and continue to touch the world. Not everybody can say that. So this is a great church. This has been a great time for the Gate Church, and I'm excited about today. Hallelujah. I need better help than that. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to, um, I want to share today a word. If you weren't here last week, I would encourage you to go and, and get a copy of it. You can get it on the YouTube page, or you can go to the website and watch it. Uh, we would, um, I would encourage you to do so. I began a, a series that's going to be fairly short, but it's off of a very familiar passage of Scripture that speaks to us specifically about an awakening. You know, our culture, uh, you're hearing the term woke a lot. People are being woke. And it's literally an indication of that there could be a possibility that people have been sleeping. How many of you know the enemy is not a creator? He's an imitator. I'm going to try that over here. The enemy is a imitator. He's not a creator. And when you recognize that, then you realize that he imitates what God intends to do. So when he begins to talk to the world about being woke, I mean, even though really it's probably because God's talking to his church about being woke. Try it over here. It could be that everything you see happening in the world is actually just a, an imitation and a, a, some, a hijacking of principles of the kingdom that the enemy is trying to implement in the earth. So when you realize that God's talking to us today about an awakening, I believe it's because people are becoming aware of things that maybe for many years they were unaware of, went unnoticed. Maybe their lifestyle didn't require it. Maybe there was no need to know. But all of a sudden, there's come a shaking. And in the midst of the shaking, we have a great need to know. Anybody felt a great need to learn something in these last several months that you didn't know before? I know there are many, many people. I'm one. There's never been a day like this to even have to lead. And so everybody's saying, okay, help me learn. Wake me up to what I don't know. I want to say this to you, church. I would change everything I do know for everything I don't know. Because there's so much I don't know. And when I realize that, I realize that God's continually trying to awaken me to what he wants to do. The next move of God, if you want to if you want to take this down in your notes, it, it's prophetic, I believe. The next move of God, the awakening that God's sending to the earth, will not just be a move of God in the church, it's going to be a move of, of the church. It's going to be a move of the church. Oftentimes we've had great stirrings that have been within the four walls of the church and people came to be refreshed. I think we're seeing God awaken the church so that we can move outside of the walls. There is going to be an increased depth of consecration. I believe we're going to see an acceleration of true godly compassion. The Bible says that Jesus, in several occasions in the New Testament, said he healed them all because he was moved with compassion. It didn't say he was moved with faith. It said his heart for them so moved them that he healed them all. What will happen when the people of God all of a sudden become so compassionate that they can't let people stay bound? Broken, 
fragmented. I believe we're going to begin to realign our lives to mission. I say this to pastors all the time. The church doesn't have a mission. The mission has a church. The mission's never changed. It's the same. We're finding out how to do it in ways that are different. I believe there's a rising tide of prayer. I hear, I hear the Holy Spirit calling us. My wife got up a few weeks ago and said to me, she said, Tony, I believe the Holy Spirit is saying to the gate church, we've got to come into a season of prayer. I'm going to be saying more to you about that in the next couple of days. Because I believe that somebody said, uh, do you not have anything that you can do? I said, yeah, I can pray. I can pray. And people say, well, can't you do something more than pray? Well, I don't know of anything greater I can do than to pray. But once I pray, there's a lot of other things we can do as well. But all the other things we do will have no life to them if we don't pray. Hmm? I believe there's emerging apostolic hubs that are going to literally shift the atmosphere of regions. I believe there are places that God is going to rest upon and they're going to be not one day a week for two hours centers. I believe they're going to be seven day a week places. I believe they're going to be constantly involved in educating. They're going to be constantly involved in teaching people how to find economic blessings and come into economic places of level ground. I believe justice is going to take place. I believe we're going to have reform. Hallelujah. I believe people are going to come to the church. There are going to be apostolic centers. It's not going to be preaching. It's going to actually be equipping people to do certain things. How do I really run a business? How do I really find out how to launch the dream that's in my heart? Because how many of you know there's a lot of people that's had a great dream and had no idea how to get started with it? How do I get started? Where do I start? What's it look like? So if you would, one more time, just stand with me as I read this passage of Scripture. I'm going to read 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse number 13 and 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse number 13 and 14. If you have your Bibles, open them. If not, it'll be on the screen. Those of you at home, make sure you read along with me. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain, or I command the locusts to devour the land, or send pestilence among my people. Let me just say something. Solomon was asking for the favor of God to be on the people of God. That's what this thing's all about. He's praying the dedication of the temple, but he's asking for something to happen in every house, every home. You have to realize that rain for these people was a a, a sign of favor because they were an agricultural society. And if they didn't get any rain, nothing about their world worked. They didn't have food things in their lives, their commerce didn't go well because they bartered and traded with the resources they had. So when he said, if I stop the rain, what he's saying is, if you come to a time in your life when it seems like there's no favor moving on your life, or there comes a time in your life when pestilence comes and it devours the land. In other words, when your atmosphere becomes full of one that you seem to always be losing and never gaining. If you're always losing ground and never gaining ground, he said, this is what I want you to do. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I'll heal their land. You know, the the common flow to that is you'd think he would say, I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sin, and I'll heal them. But he didn't say that. He said, I'm talking specifically, this is what I talked about last week. I'm talking specifically to my people. In other words, the land doesn't get healed out of Washington. The land doesn't get healed when the mayor gets the right policies. 
He said, here's how the land gets healed. When my people, when they recognize they represent me in the earth and they start living like my people, then here's my promise. I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive whatever it is that's bound them up. And I'll literally heal their environment. Last week I talked about the first part of that verse, if my people called under the, the authority of my name. Today I want to do part two. I want to deal with that part, that next part in that sentence. But here's my subject for today. Be sure you wear your apron. Be sure you wear your apron. I got an apron somewhere. I don't know where it's at. Somebody's going to bring it to me. Because I want to wear my apron today. Pastor David, will you help me find my apron? It's somewhere. Father, thank you today for the word. I ask you to speak blessing over it. I thank you for doing it today. In Jesus' name. Everybody shout amen. 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 You can be seated. I uh, was reading this week and ran across the testimony. Thank you. Thank you, because I can't preach about wear your apron and I not wear my apron. Whoop, put my mic up just a little bit. I was reading this week, um, and in my readings, I ran across the testimony of a man who was a businessman. And he actually had had a very successful business that uh, did business with several million people, he, millions of people. And his business was very prosperous. He made a lot of money. And all of a sudden, his business began to take a downturn. And he, the crisis became greater and greater. He didn't know how to deal with it. He didn't know what to do with it. And so he decided that he was going to call all of his major employees together at his headquarters, host a dinner with them, and just remind them of how important they were to the success of the company. And he prepared that day that for the banquet that he was about to have with about a thousand of his employees. And he was preparing his speech that he was going to give as the owner of the company. And his wife came to him and said, listen, I need to run some errands. Can you watch our seven-year-old son while I'm away? And he's like, he said, I started to say, but I'm trying to get my speech together. But he said, I caught my tongue and thought, okay, I can do that. So she left and he had his seven-year-old son at the house and he entertained his son for a minute and he thought I need to get my my speech done and so he gave his son something to do and he said about a half an hour later he come knocked on my door and said daddy I'm bored is there anything else I can do and he said I thought what can I do I need to get this speech together because if this this company depends on it so he said, I went and got a magazine. I'm thumbing through the magazine to find something for him to do. And he said, I see this world picture, this picture of the whole war, of the world. It's an atlas of the world. And he said, so I take it out of the magazine, take it out and unfold it. And it's pretty large. And he said, I just sort of cut it up into multiple pieces. And he said, I tell my seven-year-old son, I scatter it out all over the floor. And I tell my seven-year-old son, son, why don't you work on putting the world back together? And when you get it together, I'll give you $20. And he said, I thought, you know, I've bought a couple hours. This seven-year-old boy, he doesn't know hardly where continents are. And he said, so I went back to my office, got settled down behind my desk, and just when I picked up my pen and started writing the things for my speech, he said, I heard a knock at my door. And he said, he opened my door, and it was my seven-year-old son. And he said, I said, yes, son. He said, I'm finished. And he said, he came and showed me the atlas put back together and the world was where it was supposed to be. And he said, I said, son, that's, that's amazing. He said, how did you do that? He said, well, dad, he said, what I didn't realize is that when you put all the pieces on the floor, he said, on the back of it all was the picture of a man. He said, I don't know what the world looks like. But on the back of it was the picture of a man. And I know what a man looks like. So he said, here's what I figured out. If I can get the man together, I can get the world together. Come on. 
And the father looked at his son and said, you just gave me my speech. Because if we can get men together, we can get the world together. Here's what Solomon said. The wisest man outside of Jesus. He writes and lets us know that God's intentions on fixing the world is by having his people really take on the image they're supposed to have. When his people become representatives of him in the earth. In other words, God was saying to Solomon, watch this, I'm going to have people of distinction. Don't miss this. I'm going to put people in the earth who are the, are the alternative to what everybody else is doing. Earl Nightingale said this. He was a great motivational speaker. He said, if you want to find out how to be successful, find out what everybody else is doing and do the opposite. Because most of the time, it's not the things that everybody else is doing that really is the reflection of what God intends to happen in the earth. God's looking for people. Can I, can I say this boldly today? Can I, can I preach to my church today? Can, and other people can listen, but can I say to the gate today? God's looking for some people that will be countercultural. In other words, they don't go with the flow. They learn how to represent Jesus. I'm afraid a lot of us have had Jesus presented one way. That one of the reasons that the world don't want to talk about Christ is because of the way we've introduced him. Because how many of you know it is possible to meet Christians who are just as mean, just as ugly, just as self-righteous, just as arrogant, just as prideful as people who are in the world. You work with people that are just like that. You work with people who are dog eat dog, get even, I'm going to find my way to get what I want. They're self-centered, greedy. If I got any help in the building anywhere. But all of a sudden when people show up who are kind and loving and patient and long-suffering... I saw this on a billboard this week, said, be kind, everybody's going through something. But I mean, you know, that's so countercultural to the world we live in. And so here's what God said. He said, when my people begin to act like my people, one of the characteristics will be they will humble themselves. I lost all my amens. They will humble themselves. In other words, he's saying in order for the environment to get better, you must be willing to identify with the brokenness that's around you. When all hell is breaking loose and you feel like the nation's gone to hell in a handbasket, it's never going to get better, we need to get out of here, just the time you think everything has reached the worst it could ever be, God says, my people don't point fingers. Because after all, there is no sin that all of us are not capable of committing. Just when you think, I'd never do that, you've set yourself up for deception. So if you want to have healing, if you want to change the environment, this is what God's saying to them. If you want to bring healing to a nation, if you want to see the land healed, if you want to see the environment healed, then you're going to have to come down out of your ivory palaces. You can't stand aloof from the world you've been called to in self-righteousness. You've got to go stand in the midst of the rubble. You've got to go stand in the midst of the brokenness. You've got to stand in the midst of the misery. And you've got to represent my character in the earth. You don't show up as the answer man. You show up as a God man. Hmm. And by the way, if you, if you want to write a blog, please write a blog. And if you want to write a Facebook post, I want, I want you to make a Facebook post. Just do whatever you want. Write an article. Do anything you want to about the lack of faith and the failure of America. Tell everything that's ever been a problem in your life. But please, when you tell it, if you're a Christian, please write it with humility. 
If you're going to tear down something, please make sure there is no sin in your life before you throw the rocks. Because my, what amazes me is how many people can find what's wrong with everybody else. Not in the world, I'm talking about in the church. When God's command to us, you want to heal the environment? Humble yourself. Hmm. We talk about privilege, superiority. Maybe it is that we're experiencing right now what we're experiencing because God's trying to challenge us as the people of God. That what we're seeing in the streets and in our government and our colleges and our restaurants and neighborhoods is not a reflection just of what college classes are. Maybe it's a reflection of religious superiority. Maybe we have become what Jesus ran up against. And he's trying to move in our nation and he keeps being introduced to a group of Pharisees. We create a world of others, them people, those kind of people, based on our own sense of superiority. And we fail to remember that in the human family, loving is more difficult and more messy than labeling. It's easier for me to label you than it is to love you. Because when I label you, I don't have to deal with you. You're a part of those people. So Peter comes along and writes in 1 Peter chapter 5. This is really where I'm going to preach from. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 5 through 7 in the NIV, it says it this way. In the same way, you who are younger, submit yourselves to the elders. And all of you, somebody say all of you. Clothe yourself with humility towards one another. Because God opposes the proud, but shows favor, there's that word, favor to the humble. So humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your care, anxiety on him because he cares for you. Yeah. Now I want to read verse number 5, the latter part of it, in the, in the Passion Translation. I love it. Watch this. I'm going to show it to you. In every relationship, each of you must wrap around yourself the apron of a humble servant. Each of you must wrap around yourself the apron of a humble servant because God resists you when you're proud but multiplies grace and favor when you're humble. Two things about humility. First one is this. It's an attraction that attracts heaven and it's an attraction in the earth. When you wear humility, it attracts God and it attracts people. Peter is saying this. Am I doing okay? Can I keep going? If, if everybody online is watching, you need to hit a heart thing right there. Just, I'm, they're going to let me know that you hit the heart thing right there. Listen, Peter is saying this. He's saying the first thing people should meet when they meet you is this mark or this attitude of humility. It's your identity. Not your designer label. Not your gregarious personality. The first thing they should run into is your apron. Yes. Yes. Now, how many of you know if I, if I left church today and went to the restaurant and wore this to the restaurant, I mean, you know, somebody's going to come up and ask me about something they're eating. Hmm? 
Because he's talking to them, watch this, about an attitude that's demonstrated. I don't have time to unpack all of it, but if you, if you, if you start with verse number 1 of 1 first, of, of, of first Peter 5, he literally in the first half of 1 Peter, listen to me closely, in the first half he talks to people who are in power or in authority, he talks to them about how to wear an apron. And then in verse 5, he picks it up with those people who are under authority. He tells them how to wear an apron. Because how many of you know you are never at a place in your life, whether you're in authority or under authority, that you don't have to wear the apron? And he's basically saying to the people that are in authority, he said, here, listen, make sure that you're in authority not by compulsion, but willingness. In other words, you don't have to, you get to. Man, if you ever run into somebody serving and they serve you like they had to, uh -oh. hmm? You ever, yeah, I, I've actually said this, my wife has gotten on to me, and, and when, when Kathy wants to get on, she's not feeling well today, but when Kathy wants to get on to me, she calls me Bishop. <laughs> She'll say, well, Bishop, I'm sure they really enjoyed that. And that's her subtle message to me, you are really acting arrogant like a fool. Because there's some people, sometimes they come to wait on me or they come to do something for me. And I just look, I finally look at them and say, do you hate your job? Because you act like it. Hmm? Because how many of you know, you can tell whether somebody is serving you out of compulsion or out of a willing heart. He said, if you're going to be in authority, make sure you don't serve or you don't wear this apron with a hidden agenda. You're not trying to get some underhanded thing. He said, don't ever do it from a place of power or a place of prestige or a place of position. In other words, don't always be showing your badge of whatever your position is or using your rank to overrank somebody because that's not how my people represent themselves in the earth. If you are a boss, you don't have to be boss man. Learn how to wear your apron. And then to all of you that are under authority, recognize this, that everybody in life is under authority somewhere. May I suggest to people today that some of the biggest battles people face is because they, they don't know how to wear their apron under authority. I want to do something that's very important to the life of our church, very important to me personally very important to our team just before I keep going because I read put that verse up one more time that that, that uh, uh, passion translation in every relationship somebody say in every relationship how many of you know that means if I'm a parent to a child I don't ever get to be abusive to my child and not have to repent to them I have children in this room, adult children. I have grandchildren in this room that I've done and said things to them that I went back to them and said, hold on a minute. I was wrong. Forgive me. In every relationship, you never come to a place in your life that you don't have to put on the apron. In every relationship. Am I helping anybody today? A couple of weeks ago, we were laying hands on Josh and Lindsay, and there's a passage of Scripture in Acts chapter 13 I've preached from probably at least 100 times. And in it, it talks about all the characters that are in the church in Antioch. And it talks about people that were in, in the rooms with the leaders of the Roman Empire. They were part of royalty. It talks about people that were from other nations. And in the midst of reading that, in a hurry, time was getting away, I was very sloppy. And there's, a, there's a, a man there, his name is Simeon, and he's from a nation in Africa. And in the Bible translation, the word is spelled N-I-G-E-R. I, for years, pronounced it as Niger. It's not pronounced properly. It's actually a French pronunciation. It's Niger. The nation still exists. And in the midst of it, and particularly for people that were watching online, I went through that very quickly, and it sounded like a racial epithet. 
When I got a letter this past week, it said, Dear Bishop, this letter has come to you with love. However, my heart's heavy, and I just need to hear from you. I'm sure I'm not the only letter you've received since Sunday's message on walking worthy or Simeon's name. And what I heard was the word, and then the racial epithet was used. I was looking and expecting for something to be said this past Sunday in reference to that sermon. As an African-American member of this congregation now for 20 years, it caught me off guard and I felt somewhat offended. I'm just asking you to say something to me and a public explanation apology for your African-American congregation. I know the Lord does not want me to be silent, so I'm expressing my feelings in this letter to you. My only request is that you respond back publicly and personally. Thank you in advance for your consideration. We pray for you daily. In Jesus' name, amen. So this week, when I got that, the first thing I did is arrange the next day to have a um, face-to-face call with the person that wrote me the letter. And I just want you to know they were very, very gracious. They're very gracious. They, I'm convinced they, they love us dearly. Have been, always have been. I thanked them for writing me. I said, because if I, I've offended people historically, you can't pastor without offending people. I've offended people that was not anything meant to be offensive, and it really was something that they needed to deal with. But I felt this time, this is one of the things I need to deal with. Because never in my life have I ever used a racial epithet. I've pastored a multicultural church for 35 plus years. So the first thing I did was was call them, speak to them, ask them to pray for me. I repented, I apologized, and they received my apology, which I'm grateful for. And I believe they're online today. Second thing I did is I contacted all of our zone pastors, told them about what had happened, and repented to them because I represent this house. I contacted our staff, our executive staff, and I told them what I did, and I repented to them. And I want to say to all of you as a congregation today, I would, please forgive me, I would never do that in my life. This house is a house for all kinds of people for all kinds of people. And some people said to me, said, Bishop, I don't know that you need to do it. And I said, I do. It just happened to be that this week I'm preaching on humility. I told the individual that on the phone, I said, thank you for my illustration. Thank you for my illustration. But I hope you hear the sincerity of my heart. I don't wear this apron to be able to pull rank and privilege in every relationship. I want our African American, our African, because we have Africans and we have African Americans. I want all of our people of color to know something, I want to be your pastor. I know the pressure you face to have a white man be your pastor. And you, through great persecution sometimes, are part of the gate church. At the same time, I want your trust. And I want to be authentic and vulnerable enough that when things happen like that, now listen, you write me every week, I may not publicly apologize every week. Like, if you didn't like my shirt, sorry. But I want to be real about how we heal our land. Are we good? Praise the Lord. And as we delve into this, I believe, why would Peter write that? 
Make sure you wrap yourself in the apron of a humble service. Why, why, why didn't John write that? Why, why didn't Paul write that? Why did Peter write that? I think it might be because Peter very much was remembering a night before Jesus was going to be crucified that affected his personal life to the day he died. And the Bible says that Jesus was with his disciples. They'd been walking all day long. And they came to the room for a meal and nobody had washed their feet. And after they sat down to eat, Jesus stood up. And the Bible says, watch this, it's one part of this passage in John 13 that gets overlooked and never really talked about. The Bible says, and Jesus rose from the table, took off his robe, and girded himself with an apron or a towel. He, girded, he took off something and put on something. I'm going to say that again. He had to take off something and put on something. He couldn't wear his Messiah robes and show them what he wanted to show them. He couldn't wear his rabbi robes and show them what he wanted to show them. He had to identify with what he was trying to tell them. And he took off his robes and put on the garments of the lowest household slave that was known to his day. And the Bible says when he did that, Peter said to him, you can't do that. And Jesus said, if I can't do this, you have no part in the kingdom that I'm building. Because this is what my kingdom is all about. If you can't do this, you can't be in my kingdom. If you can't do this, you can't wear places of authority and places of anointing. Is there anybody in the building? Jesus didn't say to them, now I guess I better serve you all. You boys didn't serve me, so I guess I better serve you all. No, he didn't say that. He didn't say, well, I guess I better get around here and help somebody. He didn't say that. He said, I am going to take care of what is a daily, normal process of your life. He didn't say, I'm going to have a prayer line and show you how powerful I am. He said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put on an apron. Why? Why a towel? Why an apron? Because he was getting ready to deal with dirt that was on their feet. The dung they had walked in that day. And whatever it is they had dealt with might splatter on him. Because when you put an apron on, that's work clothes. When you put an apron on, you can't look at a man or a woman facing addiction and say, I ain't got time to get all that stuff on me. I ain't got time for you to get all that stuff on me. You can't look at somebody going through a marriage issue and say, I ain't, yeah, that stuff might get on me and I ain't got time for that. No, no, no. An apron is work clothes. We don't wear aprons much anymore, at least most people don't, but because we're so casual. But my grandmother, my grandmother Miller, my grandmother and granddaddy, my granddaddy owned a lumber business, my grandmother owned a restaurant, and she owned, they owned a truck stop, but my grandmother was raised on a large farm outside of D.C., in fact, my great granddad was the second man in the state of Virginia to ever own a car, my, governor was, my, my cousin, second cousin was governor of the year I was, I was born. My grandmother came from a home where everything was done properly. So my grandmother cooked three hot meals a day. Breakfast was always biscuits and gravy and eggs and sausage. And my granddaddy never weighed more than 148 pounds in his life. I don't know how. He'd come home from the, from the lumber yard. He came home for lunchtime. She cooked lunch. And then he would leave. She would start her duties and start things for dinner. I stayed with her when I was a child. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you could set your clock by it. At 3 o'clock in the afternoon, my grandmother would go get her bath because my grandfather came home at 4.30 and they sat down to dinner at 5. And she would start dinner. She would go get her bath. She would get dressed. She would put on pearls, jewelry every day to meet him when he came home. They were married for 60 years, and every day he came home, she met him the same way. 
But when she met him at the door with her pearls on, her earrings on, ready for dinner, she had an apron on in front of her clothes because she was still getting bread ready and still dealing with country fried steak. Come on, somebody help me. But I knew as a child when I was 10 years old and go to my grandma's house, when she had her apron on, you can pass right on through the kitchen because somebody working. Somebody is getting prepared that's going to feed somebody something that's going to provide something they need. When I saw the apron, I knew something was about to be provided. I don't know what, but I got a feeling. The world is waiting on the church to quit performing services and put their apron on because they're coming to the house hungry and ready for something to eat. And what we're looking for is people who don't have a Rolodex to point them somewhere. They got an apron that says, I'll serve you whatever you need. Have I got any help anywhere? The prerequisite to serving is humility. And the practice of humility will always lead you to serve. Did you ever notice? By every Christian magazine you can find, I challenge you. Go get all of them. You will not find a seminar on humility anywhere. Why? Because humility is not a weekend retreat. Humility is not a book to be read. It's a life to be lived. Let me tell you what humility is not. Humility is not demeaning yourself. It's not thinking poorly of yourself. In fact, Jesus demonstrated to us that humility is the mark of great confidence. Insecurity is fueled by pride. When you have to be the loudest, the most visible, the most self-promoting, it's not because you're greatly confident. Most of the time it's because you're trying to take up all the air in the room before somebody finds out who you really are. When you crave people's attention and validation, it's probably because it's rooted in pride. But humility says I prefer others above myself. Pride says I prefer myself above others. It's amazing. The closer I get to Jesus, the less I care about other people's opinions. And the more secure I feel in who I really am. Humble people submit to God. Proud people seek to use God. Because pride drives all sin. I'm going to hit that one one more time. Pride drives all sin. Eve sinned because she desired to be like God. It was her pride that made her eat. Lucifer lost his place as an archangel in heaven because of his pride. He didn't get thrown out of heaven for smoking cigarettes and drinking beer. He got thrown out of heaven because of his pride. There's a whole lot of people in the church world who won't smoke a cigarette or drink beer. And I'm not saying you should smoke a cigarette or drink beer. But I'm saying there's a whole lot of people who wouldn't do either one of those, but they walk around cont- continually toxic with their own sense of self-importance. Pride can only exist where the fear of man dwells. I'm going to try that one more time. Pride can only exist where the fear of man dwells. Because what makes me or you defensive is when we're fearful of something, of what other people may think. When David was confronted by his own wife, who wanted to live from her place of power and privilege, she looked out of the castle window at David while he worshipped. And what had happened is, David, like Jesus, 
had taken off his kingly robes. Oh, I wish I had an hour. He had taken off his kingly garments and had girded himself with the towel and the tunic of an everyday man. And the Bible says he started dancing before the Lord. And Michael looked out her window and said, My, my, how the king has distinguished himself. How you have showed yourself. People have seen you now for a common man. They'll never respect you. What are you trying to do? You've let everybody see you in a way they should have never seen you. And David said, Darling, here is my response. I will become even more undignified than this. And I will be humble in my own eyes. I'm not too good to dance and I'm not too good to lift my hands and I'm not so important I won't kneel down and pray. I am never going to be so powerful that you won't see me expressing my love to God. Come on. Yes, sir. First of all, pride, um, humility is an attraction to heaven and to the, wor- and to the world. And secondly, and I'm almost done, it's an awareness of a dependency. He said, I want you to humble yourself. Watch this term. Under the mighty hand of God, that he may lift you up in due time. Humble yourselves. Somebody say that with me. Humble. Come on, say it again. Nowhere in the Bible are we ever instructed to pray this prayer. Lord, I just ask you to humble me. Please don't pray that prayer. Because when God has to do it, it's humiliation. Please don't misunderstand me. If you don't, he will. But he says in the word, this is not my job. This is your job. Humble yourselves. What does that mean? That means humility recognizes that God always controls the outcomes. Humility recognizes that God always controls the outcomes. See, sometimes the reason we won't lay down is because we believe somebody will get an advantage over us. I know why some people never forgive because they think if I forgive, I won't be able to hold this edge. I know people that are not going to church right now because they feel like they've been victimized and they'd rather be a protester than a believer. Because it's a lot easier for me to keep my issue in the forefront than to believe that God really does control the outcomes of my life. My forgiving, my surrender, does not mean that what was done to me was right. It means that I trust him more than I trust you. I humble myself, watch this, under the mighty hand of God. We sang it today. I want salvation your way. So I quit fighting the pathway that he has me in. Do you realize in this very moment, Come on, team. This very moment, the, the environment is creating a lot of stress, frustration, anger, division, arguments. The context of 1 Peter, do you know who Peter's writing to in 1 Peter? He's writing to a group of Christians who, because of persecution, have been scattered all over the Roman Empire. They were being fed to lions, burned at the stake, killed. Not because they did crimes, but because they were Christians. And under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter writes to them and says, humble yourself under the hand that's pressing on you. Could it be that we never get the deliverance we long for because every time that hand presses, 
we find a way to get out from under it. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. In other words, stop resisting the path God has you walking. Stop fretting over what you're facing. Don't think that this is man's doings. You're mine. You're under my hand. I may not have sent it, but I'm using it. This is a moment to live the word in a visible way. When everybody else has a right to get mad, you stand up and say, I'm not going to be mad. When everybody else is getting frustrated, you say, I got peace that passes all understanding. I don't know how I got it, but I just know the one who lives in me is greater than he that lives in the world. And he's given me a grace that's beyond anything I've ever imagined. So we got as Christians, stop fighting over masks, no masks, in person, online, progressive, conservative, all the silly things we fight over. Republicans, Democrats, I mean, it's all silliness. A hundred years from now, it won't matter. In the scope of the world's persecution on Christians, what we in America are facing is primarily a first world issue. You know the email I got this week from one of our pastors in Africa? It's not COVID. People are dying in my village because we have no clean water. I think most people in the room and most people watching me today got up and you may not like it out of the fountain in your house or out of the spigot as we used to call it, but you can drink it and you won't die. Most of the world doesn't have that. You realize in China this past week, China passed a law that's headed towards the fulfillment. Here's what the end of it is. They've told all Christians, you must deny your faith and you must worship the president of China. We may have some crazy people in power. But nobody's told the churches in America to shut their doors build images to politicians he said I want you to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God watch this part of simple casting but it bothers me Bishop don't you know it bothers me I understand listen I'm going to be very honest with you I don't know anybody that doesn't hate this period we're living in except maybe few businesses that are making a ton of money delivering stuff. Nobody likes the loss of their freedoms. Nobody likes discord. Nobody likes living in chaos. But Peter said, God has brought you to a crossroads. You get to make a decision. As a believer, will you be a part of the system of the world or will you be countercultural? Will you do what I have told you to do and cast all your care? That word cast there is the same word that's used in Luke chapter 5 when it says, And Peter and his, and his friends cast their nets on the other side. In other words, take all that stuff that's bothering you and fling it out there and say, God, I don't know how it's going to work out, but I trust you. Casting. Why should I cast all my care on him, Bishop? Because he cares for you. No, he doesn't just love you. He cares for you. Whew. What Peter's saying is this. There's no real authentic humility without suffering. somebody says something to you and you want to say something back and you hold your tongue you suffered because you felt like you have a right but you died to it so let me give you write this down quickly 
how do I approach this, Bishop? Here's the application. Number one, discern how you approach relationships. Task-oriented people tend to use people to accomplish their goals. They lead from a place of power, position, and privilege. I'm a leader. I want to tell you something. I have all three. I'm not, I'm not foolish. I have all three. But they are not a reward. They are a stewardship. Because he ends that whole passage by saying, and when the great shepherd himself shall appear, you're going to give an account. Every supervisor listening to my voice today, you have position, you have certain power or privilege. But the great supervisor is going to appear. Every mayor, every senator, every congressman, when the great mayor appears, so how do I respond when I'm in authority? How do I respond when I'm not in authority? Because listen, don't miss this. Every healthy relationship can never be established on rights. If you establish relationships on rights, you establish them at the lowest level possible. Can you imagine a husband, how their marriage is going to be when a husband looks at his wife and says, it's my right for you to go to bed with me. Well, she may go, but Bubba, it ain't going to be really good. you don't appeal to rights you appeal to a level of love and relationship where you prefer another person second thing is make sure you make others the focus of your life quit chasing empire style greatness empire style greatness is whoever can get to the top of the ladder so we step on people on our way up because after all the goal of life is to make it to the top. The problem is it takes us away from Jesus. It makes us focus on ourselves. And it makes us stay hungry for the wrong things. Jesus said, you want to be great? Be the servant of all. I guarantee you there will always be a place for you in life if you'll find out how to serve other people. You'll be a high demand commodity if you make your life about helping other people be better. Thirdly, help us learn to develop the fruit of patience in our affliction. That's what humility does. God, I don't like this. I hate it. But I'm under your mighty hand. And I know that you'll give me the grace to stay here. Because you hold your hand out like a policeman in an intersection and say, stop to every person who operates in pride. But you give grace to those who humble themselves. For in due season, you'll lift me. And lastly, come on, Ashley. Song goes, today, all the Gates student ministry team come. Stay grateful for his continual release of grace and mercy. Listen to me today. Every person online, listen to me. Every person in this auditorium, listen to me. We don't deserve, nor do we earn, the favor of God. We don't deserve, and we don't earn, we deserve nothing. But yet, we are recipients of everything. Paul said, if he has freely given unto us Jesus, will he not also by him freely give unto us all things? So here's what humility does. When I see his greatness, and his faithfulness to me. And I re recognize my own bankruptcy without him. 
then I'm continually aware of what the old songwriter said. I need thee. Oh, I need thee. Every hour. Not just on Sunday, every hour. When I'm raising a teenager, I need thee. When my marriage doesn't seem to be working, I need you. When I don't know how to choose what college I'm going to, I need you. Because God has been so great and so faithful. And I'm so empty without him. That becomes the catalyst of a great awakening. I need thee.